Shalom and Bruchim Abayim. My name is Rabbi Yitzchak Shapira and I'm your host of this program Pninei HaTorah or in, or in English the Pearls of the Torah where we meet every week right before the Shabbat to start the Shabbat with a sweet, sweet aroma of studying, studying His Word straight from the Parashat HaShavua, from the weekly parasha. And what a treat we have today to have with us a special guest in the studio all the way from Florida, Rabbi Steve Bernstein. Shalom to you, Baruch Haba. We are excited. By the way, we're excited to have you in part of our Shuvu, Shuvu instruct, instructors as well. And today you're into a trip because you are going to see how Rabbi Steve, who is going to lead us in this Torah, Torah portion, have so much information and wealth. We've been sitting here and studying just before we even begun. And I learned so much just, it's, it's like a walking encyclopedia. So it's, it's just a joy to have you here and to talk with you about Parashat Beshalach. You mentioned that that was one of your favorite parashot. It is. I tell my congregation every week that that Torah portion is one of my favorites. <laughs> and we are getting ready for Mount Sinai, right? There yes. is a heartbeat, and people need to understand this. There is a heartbeat and progression here to the Torah uh, as we're getting ready for, for the giving of the Ten Words. But before we get there, uh, because I know that the Lord has play, placed uh, something specific that I feel is very important to discuss today in this Torah portion, people need to understand it, Steve, that the Torah... Uh, a portion carry a theme, right? Is that that's correct? There's a theme for the Torah. Yep, every every portion. There, there's something specific to look at throughout the entire portion. It may look like something very very different at the beginning and at the very end, but there is a common thread. There is a common thread, and we're going to talk about this common thread. And before we jump to the main text, we are. It's called the pearls of the Torah because we all have time to go through the entire portion. We'll be here all night uh, recording. So we are picking one theme, what we believe to be one of the centralized themes, and we bring it to you. But before we talk about this one theme, there's a. A concept here, I see the beginning of uh, chapter 14, the parting of uh, Yam Suf, right? By the way, the word Suf in Hebrew is, is not the red, it's Suf from the word Sof. The end, right? He's parting the end of the world, in essence, to, to the Jewish people. He is going to the end of the world. Deuteronomy 30 tells us he's going to go to the end of the world to, to, to redeem his people. And here we see the beginning of this. But in verse 9, in uh, verse 9 in chapter 14 we read Vair defu Mitzrayim and again please pick up your Bible we are using Hebrew because we both Hebrew speakers but we're going to also use the English to kind of explain to you so it's a very defu Mitzrayim and they chase after Vair defu Mitzrayim achareim Mitzrayim Egypt is chasing after them, them here Vayasigut so the Egyptians finally caught up to, to the children of Israel, and all of Pharaoh and his people are, are, are there. And it says there that they're in a place called al pi Acherut. That's the place that this happened. What, what do you think the significance of this place called al pi Acherut? Any, any thoughts on that part? We are coming into our freedom. Right. We are escaping our master in Egypt. Right. And we're coming into our freedom. And where are we coming into our freedom? Right. The word cherut in Hebrew literally means freedom. But the word al like the word pe, mouth, it says we are on the verge. On the verge of the cherut. We are not quite there yet. So something special, something the, the, the absolutely important has to happen before we can get so, our So freedom. I guess I'm going to ask you a pathetical question because I was thinking about it. In Passover, we stand up and, uh, and we sing the song, Avadim Ahinu, Avadim. And now we are Bnei Chorin. We're free. So the question becomes, the Torah suggesting here that we are not quite free yet. In your opinion, when is the freedom begin? Is it be begin with the Exodus? Truly living, or is it here? That is an important question to ask. And and the way you ask the question is perfect, because it's not a matter of when we are free; it's a matter of when our freedom is beginning, yes. and how does our freedom develop? 
we have to understand as a people that have been slaves for hundreds of years that we are coming out now and we are free. And do we know this? Well, we may know it in our minds, but in our hearts, huh. maybe we don't know it yet, or maybe partially. Freedom is something that develops. It's not something, now we are free. So, so when you're talking about the, even the concept of free, similar to the process, the process of geula, redemption, because freedom equals geula, redemption, what you are suggesting here, if I understand you correctly, that it's a proce procedural thing and then net, rather than a one-time event. Right. Right, that's exactly correct. Okay. You know, as we, uh, uh, after we're redeemed, we could look at back at our redemption, but the, right. the redemption is a process. It, it, it it's, takes time and energy, and it takes a redeemer. And, and I guess as, as application to us, the internalizing us to as a messianic believers, when we think about breaking through things such as bondages, even. That, that people are dealing with, struggle with, that itself is a process, right? Not any different than the Bnei Israel. The breaking through may be the beginning of the process. Right. The breaking through may be the ending of the process. But there is a process. But there the is key, a process. The key is here a process. There is a process that is involved. And interestingly, it's continued. So I want to develop it for a moment with you uh, a little bit more. It says, in, for, in peril, ekriv, this is verse 10, et enem, and the children of Israel looking up. And who do they see? Now, they, I want to ask your thoughts about it. It doesn't say that they see Pharaoh. It doesn't say that they see the king. It says that they see Mitzrayim, okay. Why I, this is incredible? Yeah, this is this is absolutely amazing. Well, the, why, why do you think the, 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 the Torah uses this word Veine Mitzrayim? What? It, think for a minute. They're being pursued by the most advanced military technological army in the history of the world. They have M one A one chariots right. that are coming after them. And what do they see? Do they see the chariots? Yeah. No. They don't see the chariots. Do they see the army? No. Oh, they see Pharaoh. They don't see Pharaoh. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a paradox there. They see Mitzrayim. Which means what? What, do you, what? what is their fear? What are they afraid of? Yeah. And the reality is that of all of that, the thing they're afraid of is their former master. Ha <laughs> ha. This is really what this Torah portion is about. Now that we're starting to pull this onion a little bit more, we are dealing with the question of the masterhood. Who is the master of these children of Israel? It's a question of, a mas of the master. And, Who is and the master? Look, through this entire process, Hashem has been trying to teach us with lesson after lesson, yeah. ten plagues, the Yam Suf, who is the master of Israel now? Yeah. It's yeah. the one God of Israel. Right. It's not Egypt. It's not their former masters. But who, who are we afraid of? Yeah. Our former master. Oh, interesting. It's very interesting because the next verse is interesting. After everything they have seen, everything that happened, Vayomru el Moshe, they spoke to Moshe. En kvarim be Mitzrayim? No, there's no craving in it. You take us to die in the Desert? Oh, isn't it? We're bad? going to die in the desert. That, yeah, yeah that's, that that's exactly <laughs> what they're saying to Moses. We're going to die in the, in, in the desert. Now, Evan Ezra, in his commentary, brings a very interesting point, and he asks the question, kind of going with what you're saying. He says, isn't it human instinct to know that when you are in danger, to pick up the sword and fight? That's the, the dilemma that Evan Ezra is making. He said, why are they not fighting? Why are they not fighting here? And, and he says that the reason they're not fighting is, is because they don't fully recognize yet in this Torah, in the beginning, the Torah portion, that they have a new master. This realization has not yet occurred. They've not yet processed the idea that Egypt is no longer the master. Yes. Hashem is. So really, if we take this premise for the Torah portion, this is kind of the, the beginning. If we want to draw some Musar, Musar in Hebrew means yes. ethical teaching or a conclusive, really the rest of the Torah portion go through this process of shaking off 
Egypt, in essence. That's exactly right. Right? And we're going to look at that very interesting. Interestingly enough, that in verse 14, he says, he says, God will fight for you. And I think, don't do anything. Don't even do anything. Close your mouth. Close your mouth. Don't say, I think I'm going to fight for you. So we're starting from a point. But, you know, people say to me, and I like to hear your thoughts on, on, on that. There is no grace in the Torah. There is no mercy. The Torah is a bunch of law and regulation. But when I see this, Steve, I see grace. They don't believe that they, they have a new master. In abundance, grace. Look. He's saying, don't fight, I'll fight for you. What is that but grace? Yes. He's saying, I'm going to bring you out of the land of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. What is that but grace? But it's more than what. If I am your servant, okay, and you purchase me from another master, and when you give me command, I still do not understand, you might get very angry at me. Very, but very... By grace. Yeah. By grace, I, I do for you anyway. Yeah, but this is the message of grace. This Torah is a message of grace as he prepared them, in essence, to the new master. And I think, I think there is a theme here, a repeating theme in the Torah as he prepared us. So now let's jump to the main text for a moment. Uh, in, uh, in Shmot chapter 16, Kind of, so now we, we have the background, and we're going to look perhaps starting verse, maybe verse 11, roughly about verse 11, as we look together at a couple of those things, how God prepared them, what did he do, and so forth, and how does it apply to us today? So, so we sort of fast-forwarded through coming through Yam Suf. Yam Suf, the song of Moses. Uh, the song of Moses. Yam, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're here in verse 11, which reads, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I've heard the murmurings of the people of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At evening you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Huh. Now, we just got through the children of Israel complaining at the Yamsuf. Right. And, and Hashem performed, performs a miracle. How does he perform a miracle? By grace. Yes, yes. So now we get a little bit into the desert. And they start, the children of Israel start complaining again. Now understand, I'm going to deviate a little bit. Sure, closer. that's fine. Understand that Midrash teaches us that the tribe of Ephraim tried to come out of Egypt before Moses. Interesting. Without God's permission or blessing. The Midrash actually teaches. How interesting. Our Midrash, and, and that so most of the tribe of Ephraim, not all of them, but most of the tribe of Ephraim that left Perished. died in yeah. the desert. They starved to death. They didn't have food or water. So the children of Israel knew this. They knew this. So they were afraid. Oh. So they actually had cause to be afraid here. Wow, wow, wow. So, so, so what do they think they're complaining to God? So you're saying when we look at their complaint, it's easy for us to say, oh, you complain. But there is a real reason for them. There was a real fear of perishing just as, as their forebears had perished, trying to come out of Egypt. The difference is we have God's blessing and direction. And, and interestingly, you know, the, you quoted, you just read verse 11. The verse 11 is kind of, Ending with this word, Ve'yadatem ki ani Hashem Eloichem. Right? The idea right, verse of verse twelve. Right? Yeah, uh, excuse me, verse um, it's verse twelve. Excuse me, verse twelve. Ve'yadatem ki Hashem ani Eloichem. The idea of dot, right? Knowledge to know. Yeah, but 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 let's expound it a little bit. I can know that God and and I think we all do in it a lot of the time in our life. We know that God is the maker. of and creator of all things. But that's not the Hebrew word, that. Maybe we explain, what is that? What's the meaning of that? A that is not a... a that is the confluence of wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding. So it's really what you're saying, it's something you internalize. Right. It's something cognizant. It's here, it's not here. Exactly. That is exactly the point. So really all of this is really ex exercise to getting them to the that... 
of they, Hashem their God. Hashem their God and the new master. And the new master. It's kind of where we started the discussion. So, so they're still thinking, they might know here that they have a new master, but they have not gotten it yet here, that they have a new master. They don't understand. But they're on the road to understanding. As we'll see, this is a process okay. this, uh, that we will be able to carry through. Let's continue. And it came to pass, verse 13, that at evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew that lay around the camp was gone, behold, upon the face of the midbar, there lay a small round thing, as small as hoarfrost on the ground. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? Man who? Right. Man who? Right. For they knew not what it was. And Moshe said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Wow. Okay. They were afraid. And so Hashem is giving them a lesson saying, I know you're afraid. I know you think you're going to starve to death. Here's food. For me and me alone. This wasn't food that they went out and did anything to get, other than pick it up off the ground. So again, it is a message of grace here all over again. It is not going to be by your power, it's going to be by my power. This I'm is just Hashem. You know, it's interesting that you bring up the, the, the idea that they're afraid. Uh, because, you know, Ephidimir in the Torah, Slav, right? But there's a play of war there in Hebrew. Because if you get the, 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 uh, the letters of Slav, it's Shin, Lamid, Vav. You get the word Shlav, right? Shlav in Hebrew, it's derived from the Hebrew word Shalva. Shalva is calmness. Mm. calmness of your spirit okay when Yeshua spoke you know and come they see that's a shalva he make everything peaceful so in essence we see a picture that God doesn't necessarily only care for their physical being but he care for their emotional this is their, a way of saying the comforter the then. comforter here you go that is the picture of the comforter really the menachem the comforter is right here uh, in the Torah portion. So, yeah, he's taken there through a test still, but in the test, it is still uh, a great comfort. With Chain Chesed Rachamim. So, when we're talking about grace, in essence, we think it's a grace that is boundless, you know, but it's really a grace to be successful in the tests. It's directed. Mm -hmm. It's directed so that we will pass the test. That, uh, and funny that you mentioned so that you want to pass the test. In the same chapter, just a few verses later, we were discussing this a while ago. In verse 4, it says, And God spoke to Moses. So he's giving them bread from the heaven, but he says, Yes, why I'm giving you this bread. I'm not going to give you this just so your tummy will be full. I am giving you this bread, Leman Enasenu, Anasenu, Ayelech Betorati Holo. So, what do you think going through the mind of God as he, he, He's putting this together? Well, He's telling us that the purpose of this, the purpose of this, with the, it, with, with the complaining of our people, our, our people are very good at complaining, yeah, by the way. It's I'm true. just talking. It's true. <laughs> With the complaining of our people, that Hashem is going to give us bread. He's going to rain, rain bread from heaven. Why? To see if they'll believe in him or not. To see if they will. Yelech betorati. And the word yelech here is not just a concept, oh, I say I believe. When you talk about halacha, yalech, what is he really inferring? To? Did you do it? Did you walk in and, his instruction? And that leads us to the point here. It's not an exercise. Sometimes we think like exercise. I'm thinking about the messianic movement, if I can generalize mm -hmm. it for a moment. When we say, well, I am, I'm just going to pick some extreme example, but I'm sure you heard us before in your show. Well, I'm Torah observant. Right or or I keep the feast or or I I I I, I live Jewish Jew, I live Jewish life. But in the end of the day, what determined those things? Let's take like Torah observance. 
is not what you say, it's and it's true. not even what you think. It's actually what you do. James said, faith without works is dead. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and this, is, this is what Hashem is looking for right here, right now. But he's saying in this test, let me, let me make sure. So here I can kind of put, uh, you know, I was in Israel. I got to tell you something funny. They took me to uh, pedal on a bicycle and I get tired. But then they reveal a secret for me. They told me, well, it is an electric bike. Yeah. <laughs> so all what you have to do is press this little button and, and somebody's going to pedal for you. Now, yes, you still need to pedal. But it will do the assisted pedaling. So I got really, I got hooked on this thing. I just left it on the rest of the ride. In essence, that's what God's saying here. He's like, I am going to require you to pedal as you recognize me as the new master, but I'm going to give you some paddle assistance. Right? That's, right. In, that's in essence what it is about. And he's going to give us the assistance so that we will know that he is our new master. That's the point. That is the point. So, so really, when we receive things from Hashem, right, it's kind of his application for us. When we, re when we receive a, a gift from Hashem from above, we need to, A, recognize that all things that are given to us, all good things that are given to us are from above. And B, to real recognize when Hashem blesses us, He's doing it for a purpose. And the purpose is, Vayatatim, so that we will we'll know. know. No, not here, but know here. Beautiful. Do you have time? I have another yeah. midrash. Yeah, absolutely, we have time. It's called the Midrash of the Four Kings. It's from uh, Ruth Rabba. Okay. The the and it talks about four kings and their relationship with Hashem. It talks about David. Okay. Asa. Okay. Yehoshaphat. Okay. And and uh, uh, um, Okay. Cheskiyahu. Okay. Okay. So David is facing an enemy. And in the Tanakh, he, he's facing the enemy and he goes to God and he says, please defeat this enemy for me. And Hashem responds. And David goes out and he pursues the enemy and he runs them down and he defeats them. Okay. And he comes back and he blesses the name of the Lord for helping, for, for defeating the enemy. Now Asa goes out and says, God, please help me defeat this enemy. Okay. And he says, I don't have the strength to defeat the army, but, but we can pursue them. And so he goes and pursues and stops, and Hashem defeats the army. Uh -huh. Yehoshaphat says, I don't even have the strength to pursue, <laughs> but I will sit here and sing your prayer, stand here and sing your praises until you defeat the enemy for us. And he does. He stands there. He sings the praises of Hashem. And Hashem defeats the army for him. And Chazkiyahu says, I don't even have the strength to get out of bed, but I will lay here until you defeat the enemy. And Hashem does. So, Midrash asks, who has the greatest faith? Wow. I... I don't know. You tell us. I'm, now I'm in the edge of my seat. It's David. Because David went out and put forth every effort he possibly could in the name of Hashem, defeated the enemy, and knew at the end of the day, it was all Hashem. Uh-huh. Wow, that's an oh. That's absolutely fantastic. Because it's interesting because that's exactly what you see in the Torah. It's exactly what you see. Because what happened here toward the end of the Torah? After everything said and done, after all this process said, he says, Kum, be resurrected now. Go choose the people and do what? Fight, Fight against Amalek. And the interesting thing is, he says to him, say, so the beginning of the portion, they are like Chizkiah, you know? They, are, they, they cannot even move that <laughs> parallel because they don't realize they have a new master in town. Right. And this is the learning process for them of learning that they are not slaves in Egypt anymore, mm -hmm. but we are slaves to the God of Israel. And we are slaves to the God of people. We don't like the word slave, but Apostle Paul started all of his letters with saying, I am the servant, I am the slave, the word Avadim. I, I have a master. Yeah. 
People don't want it because people say, well, we are free. Yes, I am free. Like David was free with his I, army. I, yeah, you know, I am free. But, you know, in rabbinical Judaism, when you study under a rabbi, you are in what they call chatzerot. You are in the chatzer. You are in his a court. So in essence, he's saying you're free to roam in my court, but you're not really free. If you're, you think you're free and you leave the court, then all the blessings are going away with this. We're not free in that essence. And that's where the term freedom, why we're free, is, is I think loses its, its context here. Absolutely. See, in essence, the, the Torah says to you, yes, you're free. You're free to get up and pick the best man and go fight. I'll fight for you, yeah, but you need to do something here too. Right. And it's different at the beginning of the, par beginning of the Parsha and at the end of the Parsha. Right, right. So, so we have this concept here of this love. It's trying to calm them down. In essence, I see a picture. I don't know how you feel about it. This shalva in Hebrew of the new heart of Jeremiah 31. He's in essence giving them a, new, a truly a new heart, I sense here in the Torah. But then he gives them this man. The man, the, the man, or as we call the man. What do you think that's represent? There's a preparation here. I know the rabbis speak about uh, the connection to Shabbat. Perhaps we can even extrapolate on that just for a moment. But realistically, okay, it, and the lesson is brought forth even more during the Shabbat. What God is saying is, I will give you everything. I'm going to strip you yes. of any idea that you have that you are dependent on anyone else, on a former master. You're not dependent on them. You're don't, dependent on yeah, me. Don't you find it interesting that the Torah also tells us, uh, uh, Rabbi Steve, that uh, they could not pick up the Slav right. and gather it and then keep it for the next day. It said a limited expiration, only one day, good today. Tomorrow is no good. And then suddenly, tomorrow it is good when you collect twice the amount for Shabbat. Only you must, on Shabbat. You must follow Torah T, my instruction. So we, if we are to recap the Torah, really in one sentence or two sentences, it is right here in Beshalach, right? It's the, all in, in Beshalach. The, the, the essentiality of the Torah of saying this, if you feel free to enter it, but what I understand here, or the quote-unquote Torah observance is one who chooses first and foremost to have trust in what is given to him that is sufficient, as we say, Dianu. It is sufficient. What he has given us is sufficient. Is understanding given that there is sufficiency. And Hashem is giving the people no choice. You are dependent on me. There, you, there is no food around. You know what happened to Ephraim. You're going to die unless you trust mm -hmm. in me. Mm -hmm. And what do what I tell you to do. That's how you show your trust is by doing. So trusting, but here's the thing. Trusting is not an exercise of the mind no. only. It's an exercise truly of the heart and your Action of your halacha, in essence, is a, yes. from the heart. If, if it is in the heart, then the halacha will reflect it in essence. <laughs> it's interesting because the word here in Hebrew, man, they don't even know what is they it. They say, know what, what is man, right? Uh, some of the rabbis suggest to us that the man, the word man, is, is this, the suffix of the word amen. You know, because amen in Hebrew it doesn't mean let it be, as some say. <laughs> amen says in Hebrew, Adonai. Melech Neeman, the Lord is a faithful king, okay, he's a faithful king. And I think that's the, the message that he's giving him, and they say, oh, by the way, this thing that I'm going to give you seems like it's a redundant, right, the food. There's a midrash that talk about the way this thing, this thing tastes even, right? No, oh, yeah, it's in Talmud. And uh, it's in uh, Yoma chapter 75. And what does it say there in Yoma, Yoma 75? What does this taste like? It asks the question, what does this taste like? And like basically, <laughs> it says that it tastes like anything that you want it to taste like. So let me get it like, if I like ice cream, 
it stays to me like ice cream and it's Absolutely. water. So in essence, we read it and we say, well, it's redundant day and every day, the same thing over and over again. But really, for them, if they wanted the next day to taste something else, it would taste it as something completely else. Yeah. It could taste like basically anything that you want. What do you think the Moussar in this for us? Well, there is an interesting comparison. This is Torah according to Rabbi Steve. This yeah. Is, one of the great commentators of the Shuvu Yeshiva, by the way. So, the idea here is that man represents in and of itself. Yeah. Here, this portion is always very close to Tu Yeah. So that the man represents every good thing that we were given to eat on the trees in the Garden of Eden. That makes sense. That's an amazing revelation. So this man is the good things that Hashem created and brings us back to the garden. To the garden. Oh, and it's interesting. I was thinking about the passage from Tehillim from the Psalms that says, "Ta'amu ureu kitov Adonai." Taste God and experience that the Lord is good. There is it, man. Yeah, that is the really the, the 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 man. God is not a God that you are. Hypothesis, hypothesis. You know, sometimes in a master, I'm thinking about the master and the servant relationship. You think about the master that, you know, the servant never sees the master. It's very distant. Never, that's the first thing that comes probably to our audience. The end self. The, the end self, because they're very, very far. But that's not the picture of a master and a servant in the context of ta'amu and re'u and giving in the man. And chesed. It's almost like getting a picture, a prophetic picture of the master who see the servant working in the field. and he's Like the, the ma master and the original servant in Gan Eden. Yes. And he come to him and he give him, hand feed him, the man and the slav. So, well, this, is, this has been rich, rich time for us. Talk to us for a conclusion because I want to close. We talked a lot about the spiritual journey because here we are, we are working with the man with this idea toward Mount Sinai, right? right. Where do you see spiritually disconnecting here to Shavuot, to Mount, Sin, uh, to Mount Sinai, to the giving of the Torah? Well, kind of, we, we talked earlier about this being a process. Right. That this is a process that the children of Israel are going through. The process of giving up the master of Egypt and taking on uh, Hashem's uh, um, sovereignty. Sovereignty. Oh, That's rest. the first part of, of Beshalach, all the supernatural, all the miracles. So, in this process, we see the physical, but the spiritual is there. That from Yam Sof until Sinai, yes, fifty days, right, and so we begin to elevate spiritually. We gain more and more spiritual dot understanding. And that's what it is. Day dot. by day by day. That's truly the counting of the fifty days of the Omer. So, so that's the counting of the Omer, but. More even than the counting of the Omer, you know, we have a, a expression in, in rabbinical uh, Judaism called hashkafa, the way one watches the world. So in essence, what you're telling me, it applies also to the way we are to uh, uh, view the, the world, the view, the view the world, and more than viewing the world, view each other. Right. We are not to view each other as sometimes we do as a deficits. Let's say we are, you know, going downstairs or down, down, down the mountain. But really you need to see where everybody is and to look really how can we be part of helping each other to get to the next level in essence. Because we're not getting to the next level without each other. Without each other and without Hashem, of course. Without Hashem. Wow. What, what an amazing uh, uh, Torah, Torah portion. So what has been pressed in my heart to share with you and... You know, we talked a lot about Yeshiva Shuvu as well. How much we desire to see people not just go through theology, but go through experiencing of that. Really, that's what we're talking about. That? Experience of revelation from God. A revelation with God 
start with exactly what God says. Stand back for a moment, close your mouth, be still, and know that I am Hashem, your God. Amen. And when that process begins, then He will let you, kind of you see in the Torah, in the end of the Torah, kind of the climatic finish, now you're ready to fight for Amalek. Amalek is all around us in the world, you know, in different form, in different shapes. And until Mashiach comes, we, will, will, be. we mm -hmm. will continue to fight Amalek. That's what the text really says. Uh, you, you quoted a Midrash that says that Mashiach will defeat Amalek uh, uh, once yeah. and for all in the end. But our prayer for you today, if you watch this program, is to truly know that there is a living master who is a Lord of grace that is willing to go today and give you a trial that you will, can pass and be successful in. That's a grace. And this grace comes to us through a comfort. It's a comfort that is gave. That he gave it. The, the Slav is a picture of the comfort of the Ruach HaKodesh. If you are interested to know more about how to obtain the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, write us. Write to us. We would love to share with you the Besorah of our precious Messiah. But let us close, perhaps, Rabbi Steve, we always close with a, a word of prayer for everybody who watch. Maybe some, somebody today have two masters, but today is a season that God wants to get to the one true master, the one of Israel. Do you care to lead us today in our tefillah? Certainly. Yes. Av HaRachabim, Father of Mercy. I ask you to look at all of the people that are watching this, that are interested in supporting Shuvu, and see anything that is within them that needs to be adjusted. In your mercy, kindly, patiently adjust everyone yes. in the way that you would have them go, that they may live a full and abundant life with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge in Yeshua, our beloved Messiah. Amen. 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 On behalf of Ahavata Mi Ministries, Rabbi Steve, it's been so wonderful having you in the studio with us and, and sharing with us so many, many wonderful insights for this Torah portion. We would like to wish you Shabbat Shalom, Mevorach, may the God of Israel bless you with a sweet, sweet Shabbat. Until next time, we will see you. Kol Tuv, Velitraot.